back here for another Six Rings and Football Things, and it is a mock draft edition. It is mock draft season because we are still, quite frankly, six weeks away from the 2024 NFL draft, but we are all hell-bent on figuring out what the hell is going to happen for the New England Patriots and the rest of the NFL. I'm Andy Jumbo Hart. He is WEEI.com's Mike Cadlick, and he is the author of where I would push you over to WEEI.com for his latest updated Patriots-centric mock draft, which means, yes, it is not a traditional first-round type mock draft. It is Patriots picks through the totality of the draft, which means it probably starts with a quarterback. I don't want to... Um, I don't want to mislead the listener. You never know. But you we, never know. Uh, before we get into Mike's, I actually want to talk about mock draft season, the All changes, right. why people are changing it, Mike. Um, so we've had in the last 24 hours or so, Mel Kuyper, the godfather of draft coverage and mock drafts, release his on ESPN. We've had Daniel Jeremiah, who has become the guy for NFL Network, NFL.com, sort of taken over for the Mike Mayock role in the past with a mock draft and everything he does. The mock We've father had, junior, I would call Jeremiah. Mock right father now. junior. I like yeah, it. Um, nice. And then locally we have a Patriots mock draft from the Boston Herald, Doug Kide, who um, put together one that I would say is borderline my dream mock draft. Sorry, no disrespect to you and yours and what That's you've okay. been doing for us. Um, so let's start with the two big name ones. Yeah. Daniel Jeremiah has Jaden Daniels, I believe, um, yep. going to the Patriots. He has been on the record of late um, sort of talking anecdotally that he thinks the Patriots are going to stay put at three. He thinks their plan all along was to get a veteran quarterback and then draft a quarterback at three, sort of like Mass Live has reported. Mm -hmm. Well, they have Jacoby Brissett, and then they can just stay at number three, and whether it's Daniels or May, he thinks they're going to take him. Um, the flip side of that, or, or, or a little different um, trend, is – Kuiper, who still has the Patriots taking a quarterback at three, he has them taking Drake May mm -hmm. after, obviously, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels go before. But he, in his little write-up, said he's a little bit more open to the idea of the Patriots trading now. Um, and I know the Vikings deal for another first-round pick has injected life into those talks that the Vikings could have two or three first round picks to throw at the Patriots for number three. Yep. And I found it interesting that Kuiper, for whatever he hears, whatever he listens to, whatever he analyzes, tea leaves, whatever, is now a little bit more open to the Patriots trading. So before we get into Doug Kide's dreamy mock draft for the Herald, yeah. <laughs> and before we get into your mock draft, where are, and I think this kind of leads us into yours to some degree, this discussion yep. of stay put for a quarterback, trade down, I mean, I guess I'll throw the other option out there, which is the Fitzy option, which is best player available. Just sit there and take Marvin Harrison Jr. Although I shouldn't say that because there's some out there that have Marvin That's Harrison Jr. That's what I was Jr. just going to build up that. Receiver, yeah. All of that crap. So where do we stand, not necessarily on the player, but the uh, affinity, I guess, for Elliot Wolf to trade out of that spot? I ultimately still think that they're going to stick and pick at three. I think, like you mentioned, that's been their plan. That was the talk at the Combine. That's what came out of the Combine from Mass Live. That's what Jeremiah has since uh, echoed, uh, that that was the talk of the Combine, that veteran quarterback, get rid of Mac Jones and bring in the rookie. Um, and that's what Albert Breer also said the other day that he heard from the Combine was that teams like the Falcons, before they signed Kirk Cousins, uh, we're trying to trade up into the top three and it was, they hit a brick wall, I think is, you know, the way they mentioned. So um, as of right now, I, I don't want to go against that. I think that that's what they're going to do um, is stick and pick at three. I think that's what they should do. I think uh, you need to bring a quarterback in here and, you know, groom him behind a guy like Jacoby Brissett and, you know, build him into your offense and build the offense around him. And whether that is Drake Mayer, Jaden Daniels, that obviously remains to be seen, um, but I think they're going to do what they can um, to make themselves comfortable with either player. Um, now, is that the right thing? Is that the wrong thing? I guess that's, you know, that's more so up to the coach in the front office. Like if they're not sold on a guy, then I think they should trade out of the pick. Um, I don't think they should take Marvin Harrison. I think they should, you know, again, uh, like you mentioned, guys like Jeremiah and, you know, some of these other draft gurus right now, I, I don't want to say they're leaning off of Marvin Harrison Jr., but I think, you know, the Malik neighbors and uh, Roma Dunes of the world are really starting to 
you know, people are starting to dive into them more and they're, you know, starting to close the gap on Marvin Harrison. So there's a multitude of receivers. There's a multitude of uh, offensive linemen. So again, if you're not sold on that quarterback being your guy, I think you should trade out. But ultimately, I like both players. I think a lot of people like both players. I think a lot of people think that those top three guards are the top three players in the draft. And I think you should stick and pick and take one. And I think that's where they're going to end up going uh, as we sit here, like you said, just over six weeks until the actual uh, decision has to be made. Okay, so what's your read on then? If we accept that those three quarterbacks are probably going to go one, two, and three to somebody, yeah. whether it's the Patriots or not, um, what's your latest read where we have J.J. McCarthy maybe going in the top six, maybe a one, two, three, five, fifth quarterback going in the top half of the first round, mm -hmm. The this pushing of that second, third tier, whatever you want to call the tiers of quarterbacks, up the draft. Do you think that in any way – impacts the thinking of the Patriots. Hey, maybe they were like, you know what? Yeah. We were thinking of trading down, but everybody else is coming up for these quarterbacks. Like the value of, I, I don't, I don't even know what, how it would affect their thinking, but does this late push, if it's real, if it's not a media fabrication, does this late push of other quarterbacks into the top half of the draft affect Patriot thinking in any way? I do think they have to listen. Um, you talk about Minnesota, which well, I mean, we're obviously going to get to, but they, they pick up their second uh, first round pick. Now they have 11 and 23. That tells me they're quarterback hunting. I think they're trying to grab some ammo and they're trying to go and get one of these guys. And, you know, that would probably tell me that they fell in love with J.J. McCarthy enough where either if he falls to 11, you take him, or if you can't get into that boxed-in top three, that you like J.J. McCarthy enough to say, okay, we still have the ammo to go get him at four, five, six, you know, or even the seventh pick. Um, I wonder, too, if the changing of the wide receiver narrative would change Arizona's thinking at all of trading out of four where Minnesota then goes up to four because they're not gung-ho on Marvin Harrison and they realize that they can get, you know, they could wait till 11 and take a Brian Thomas or even if Roma Dunes a falls or something like that. So uh, I, I do think that Minnesota, you know, sort of stockpiling picks is going to change, not so much change opinions, but it's going to get people thinking, you know, they're going to call, they're going to offer, they're going to make, you know, have conversations about it. And I do think that if they send this, you know, godfather offer that, you know, everyone thinks they will to the Patriots, um, where the off season has gone so far, where they haven't made huge splashes and, you know, they haven't really burned cash like, uh, like Mayo said they would originally, um, they should at least listen to the offer and see if they can, uh, you know, pull off a King's ransom for the pick. But um, at the end of the day, again, sold on quarterback. If you're sold on quarterback, there's no reason to, you know, to rob Minnesota blind because if they pick Drake May and Drake Pay May turns into a, you know, a 10 time all pro and a three time Super Bowl champion, who cares if you got that extra first round pick or whatever? So uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's draft season. So, you know, anything can really happen right now. Okay, so I'm going to treat this podcast like it's a concert, and therefore we had the opening acts of Mayo and Jeremiah and that talk. You are the headliner, the WEEI.com okay, um, Patriots mock draft. But in between, we got to got to get to an up-and-coming act that's probably going to be headlining its own tour in a, very soon, <laughs> and go. that is Doug Kide, the Boston yep. Herald. He has Drake May at number three, and then he has the Patriots trading back into the back end of the first round, I believe 29 overall from 34. Yeah, that to select A.D. Mitchell, wide receiver, mm -hmm. Texas. And you know this from some of our positional podcasts here on the Six Rings feed and other things we've done. I love A.D. Mitchell. I think he's going to be a star. If you give me Drake May, my potential franchise quarterback, and A.D. Mitchell, my potential franchise wide receiver, with the first two picks, that may be the greatest Thursday night in the history of <laughs> Thursday nights on April 25th. So do you think there's any... Um, Anyway, that's a possibility. Is it realistic? Will Will A.D. Mitchell be there? I know some people think he may go a little higher in the yeah. first round. Do you think the Patriots would trade there instead of with the third pick, maybe move back into the first round? I Yeah, I do think so. I think, um, you know, the Packers did that a couple times. Um, and I don't know if, you know, I can't, I can't think of it was the Elliott Wolf um, when it was with Elliott Wolf there or not. I, it's, it's not ringing a bell if it was with them. But there was times where, you know, they traded back in for Jordan Love and they traded back in for, I think, Rashawn Gary. And I think cornerback Eric Stokes, you know, was a back end of the first round. And again, some of these, I don't know if they were trade at, trade ins, but like there's there's an opportunity to get aggressive there if a guy you love falls that much. And I think 
when they traded Mac Jones for the sixth round pick. I know another, you know, adding a sixth round pick to the deal isn't necessarily going to do it, but they have a bit more ammo later on now um, to make a move like that. And, you know, when we did the post NFL combine mock draft, um, I had them taking Jaden Daniels, I think at third. And then I had AD Mitchell of them at 34 um, after his uh, combine performance. And now, you know, as the weeks go on, and even then after the combine, I didn't think it was incredibly realistic that he goes at 34. I think he's going to be a first round pick. Um, and as the days and weeks go on, I think he's creeping more into the top 15 uh, than he is to the back end of the first round. And so um, again, if he falls, if there's that, if there's not that run of receivers that we expect uh, kind of like last year, right. When, you know, we talked about it last week with Shime on our prospects pod, where all of a sudden receivers weren't going in the first round last year. And then Zay flowers, Quentin Johnson, um, and J, like JSN and I think one more guy kind of went in four straight picks. And so um, you just never know how it's going to fall. But if the opportunity comes and they love a guy like A.D. Mitchell, then they should absolutely pounce because they haven't done this weaponizing that Elliot Wolf was mentioned. And so they're going to have to do it eventually. Um, and I think that is that, you know, that's prime real estate to do it. You get the fifth year option, you get a premier pass catcher. And the receiver class is so deep that, that again, that is a that's a section of the draft that I think they should target. So real quick, before we move on to your mock draft, I just want to remind people, first of all, go over to the Six Rings feed and listen Mm -hmm. to the entire Wide Receiver Prospect podcast. But A.D. Mitchell in particular, a Georgia transfer to Texas, 6'2", 205, ran a 4'3", 4'40", at the Combine. Not quite as fast as his uh, Longhorns teammate, Worthy, who ran the 4'2", but I can live with 4'3", 4'. That is uh, fast enough, as they say. Uh, 55 catches, 845 yards, 11 TDs last year. Um, he has great, in my opinion, great hands, great body control, great catch radius, jumps, good feet. I see a legitimate total package wide receiver who Mm -hmm. some might say, well, 845 yards. Well, remember they had some QB, um, issues there uh, Mm -hmm. back and forth. Ewers got hurt. He wasn't playing. And I just think sometimes guys are better pros. Like they, they develop into better pros, longer season. Like you'll see those numbers blow up. They become the guy. So I am all in on A.D. Mitchell, and if you get Drake May and A.D. Mitchell, it will be as excited as I've been about the Patriots since they took Andy Katzenmoyer in the first round way back when. So, um, Did you just uh, like that because his name was Andy? Well, some of that. Plus, he was like the big-time Ohio State linebacker, yeah. and like it never panned out or anything. But right. no, that was youthful Andy, and this will, this will be a, a boost of youth in New England, both for the team and for my energy around the team. So yeah. after that, okay, now we get to Mike. Cadlix, weei.com is this 3.0 i believe mock draft 3.0 yes it is okay so we've washed away the first two he decided those weren't good those weren't realistic we've now gotten to model 3.0 this is the one he's going to live by this is the one no, he's going to stick with no 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 but what why why would you put it out there if you if you don't have con- ultimate confidence in it no nah, they're just you just do different iterations of what may happen again i said it before you know we'll get to it there's there's the like I did post Super Bowl, I did post combine, yeah. and now I do yeah. post free agency. So you, you tinker with what may may happen. Um, this isn't necessarily a prediction. This is what may happen for the Patriots on draft. So this isn't better. Weekend. This is not a better three no, point doesn't mean it's better than two point. No, it does not necessarily mean it's better. It's just a different iteration. Okay, so hit me with it. What do the Patriots right. do in the first round? First round pick number three, and they trade the pick. They trade the pick. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. You suck. <laughs> so I have them trading the pick here. I had to squeeze this in into one of my mock draft iterations, which again is why I say that this isn't necessarily a prediction. This isn't necessarily what I may think is best. When does 4.0 come out? <laughs> it is a way. We'll, uh, we'll get to it. What, what do we got? Six weeks left? Maybe in another three weeks. And then we'll. I better we'll like a, that one more. Yeah. We'll have a final draft night. Uh, the draft night one will be what I think they should do. Uh, and that'll be my best top prediction. But for now, an iteration, because it is, again, it's a realistic scenario that they do trade out of this pick, especially with the lack of action they had in free agency thus far. Like they didn't really fill any of their major holes. They brought a lot of guys back. Obviously, the Owen Wenu and Hunter Henry and Kendrick Bourne signings, like, those are all great, and I think that they're the signings they needed to make uh, internally. They let Trent Brown go, they let Devontae Parker go, and they let Mac Jones or they trade Mac Jones. Like they got rid of the the poison, if you will, and they keep the guys who are the team builders. But they didn't land a top tackle. They didn't land a top receiver. So they still have a ton of holes. Minnesota trades into the first round with pick twenty three. 
And I have them trading 11, 23, and their 2025 first round pick to the Patriots for pick number three. Patriots kick the quarterback can down the road another year, and they keep building this team out uh, the way that Elliot Wolf probably secretly deep down wants to do. He wants to go. He wants to get capital. He wants to get players and try and make this thing QB ready. I'm sorry. You seem upset, but hey, look, and I know, and Albert Breer also did say that, you know, the pay, like we talked about, there's, there's a brick wall um, behind the number three pick. And, you know, those guys, those teams are set on quarterbacks through the first three picks. But if Minnesota keeps calling, if the Patriots keep their evals on the quarterbacks, they may trade out. So right now, now they have 11, 23. Minnesota has a rookie quarterback that they play. They stink perhaps this year. And then you get their first round pick next year. And then you have two picks to work with next year in the first round. Maybe you get a quarterback there. Maybe you maybe you sign a quarterback later like the Falcons did. They build and they sign a quarterback. We'll see. But for now, in this mock draft scenario, 11 and 23 are your now first round picks for the Patriots. Okay, so let's just keep moving because I hate this idea. <laughs> but let's go. Number 11, who are you Number taking? Number 11, we are taking... Left tackle, Olu Fashanu, Penn State, the dancing bear. We talked about him last week on the mock draft or on the uh, the prospect pod. A guy who uh, his athleticism is, you know, through the roof 6'6, 312. Um, he got all the awards last year, Big Ten offensive lineman of the year. He was all Big Ten. Um, a guy who, you know, to you know, add some context, Alonzo Highsmith and assistant offensive line coach Robert Kugler were both at his pro day last week uh, at College Station. So they're doing some homework on him. A guy who comes in, plays from day one, is your left tackle from day one and uh, sets the edge. Especially, again, you lose Trump Brown. You didn't plan your left tackle. Olu Fashano becomes your franchise left tackle for the next 10 plus years. That's the pick at number 11. Okay, so I mean, obviously, we understand the logic. Um, they did. There is. There's some logic to it. I don't know if it's going to happen, but there is logic to it. There's definitely logic. You build the roster. This whole idea that the Patriots aren't QB ready. This would be a step toward getting QB ready. You get your franchise left tackle, assuming he is that, and he is a prototypical kind of athlete for that position: length, height, the whole thing. Um, so it's fine. I'm not gonna urinate all over it just because I don't really like it and I'm fixated on the quarterback and sulking a little bit. Um, it, <laughs> you didn't it's, talk it, for like three minutes when I just went yeah. through all that. You were just sitting there. I just let you have your moment in this <laughs> idiocy sunshine or whatever we want to call it. Um, so, okay, you get your tackle. Yep. Now you have another first round pick coming you because do. you made this trade. Who are you taking at 23? With the 23rd pick, the Patriots take LSU wide receiver Brian Thomas Jr., a stud. Okay. A tier one wide receiver, in my opinion, who, because of Xavier Worthy's stock going up, because of A.D. Mitchell's stock going up, Brian Thomas all of a sudden gets lost in the draft, and the Patriots sit at 23, just like they did last year at 17, picking Christian Gonzalez. They get one of the best players in the class, and the Patriots do the same with Brian Thomas Jr. Uh, 6'2", 210, lightning quick, ran a sub four, run a 4-3-3 at the 40, Led the NCAA in touchdowns last year alongside Jaden Daniels. Just a stud stud of a true X wide receiver that, again, you failed to land in free agency. You didn't land your Calvin Ridley. You didn't land your, you know, Mike Williams yet. You didn't trade for Keenan Allen. So now you got to do it through the draft. Brian Thomas is a true X. You add him to the room with Kendrick Bourne and KJ Osborne and uh, Demario Douglas. And now you have somewhat of a full set of wide receivers. I think Thomas is going to be a stud at the next level. I think he's the third best wide receiver in the class behind Harrison and Adunze. Um, I think it's a slam dunk at 23. And again, you haven't filled quarterback. Well, you filled quarterback with Brissett, but you didn't fill tackle and wide receiver in free agency. You do have to hit on these. But again, if you can bring in Fashanu and Brian Thomas in the first round, I think that's a, that's a pretty good haul for uh, – sorry, I keep getting Rappaport uh, notifications, making sure they're not Patriot-centric. But uh, yeah, Fashanu at 11. Brian Thomas Jr. at 23, I think that's worth it for the number three overall pick plus the tw- plus, bleh, plus the first round pick next year. This is obviously sort of textbook non-quarterback draft. Like you trade Correct. out and you get you fill your spots. And I don't hate the idea of Brian Thomas. Um, I actually like him. I kind of put him with A.D. Mitchell. I think they have some similarities. I think they're yeah. going to be really good all-around pro receivers. Um, similar size, similar speed. 
Um, and I also similarly like both of them. I think their teammates are overhyped. I think neighbors is overhyped and I certainly think worthy is overhyped. Yeah. And I think in a weird way, these guys might be a little undervalued as the second option, quote unquote, coming out of their school. So again, I don't hate this hey, plan. Justin Jefferson was the second option at LSU behind Jamar Chase. And what do you know? He's the best receiver in football now. Right. And that happens. Like that yeah. happens. Guys mature. They get better coaching. They get more stability at quarterback, whatever some of the, the various reasons that can lead to that. And I just, I really like his game. Um, so I don't hate this pick as much as I hate the trade. Like yeah. if they are at 23 somehow, some way, and they take Brian Thomas, I will be happy about it. I will embrace it. Yep. Even if I say, okay, but who's playing quarterback? Cause that's the one thing it feels like you're doing. I mean, we haven't picked it at 34 yet, mm -hmm. but I don't know that you're answering the quarterback question. So who are you taking at number 34? Another wide receiver. So we're not Ladd getting a quarterback. We're not getting a quarterback. We're kicking quarterback down the down the road. Um, Jacoby Brissett is this team's starter uh, for the majority of 2024 in this scenario because you bring in Georgia's Lad McConkey to the wide receiver room. Oh boy, you're not a McConkey guy. I am a McConkey guy. Uh, this kid runs the best route in the entire class. This dude, so you're a McConk honk. I oh god, you are. Yeah, you know, I you know, I move out a couple of months ago. I get get away from my parents, and now I got to re record podcast twice a week with a guy with who's just filled with all the dad jokes in the world. It's indeed, indeed, yeah, it's tough. But uh, I am a McConk honk. Uh, I do love Vlad McConkey, best route runner runner in the class. Guy separates with the best of them. This team has not had a separator, short or long, in the last five years. Like they just don't, you know, what. Well, can I push back a little on that? And that's where, sure. when I read this, um, I'm not a McConkie huge supporter. I know he seems to be rising up the draft boards very quickly and his mm -hmm. stock is high. Is there, and correct me if I'm wrong, he's a little bit bigger, but mm -hmm. is there a redundancy or role overlap with Demario Douglas? I thought you had drafted Demario Douglas to be your underneath slot, quick, get open kind of guy. Would they play in tandem would yeah. is Mario du like how, how how do you envision this depth chart coming together he is like a faster cooper cup to me okay like he doesn't just play inside he can play outside he again he can separate long he can separate short he's not just an underneath guy to me i think he's a guy who can get to the second level and make plays there too so i do think they all play in tandem and does the kj osborne signing maybe throw a wrench into this a little bit because I think that you know more of a Z where you know the Z is not your prototypical obviously X on the outside he can play inside outside he runs across the middle he can get open downfield too but it's you know it's more of a um, pick your poison type receiver that's what I think of Vlad McConkey as you can put him just about yeah. anywhere um, and look if the Patriots cut KJ Osborne so be it like it, that doesn't really we just signed him I know, but I'm saying if you end up like I don't see KJ Osborne being a roadblock to drafting Lad McConkey at 34 and bringing in two wide receivers. No. You know what I mean? Like there are a lot of times. Guy. Yeah, exactly. He's just a guy. And he, he, look, I I liked him in Minnesota. I think he's a good addition, depending on what you do for the for the low money. But it, again, it's not the it's not weaponizing your offense bringing in KJ Osborne by any means. So I like McConkey. I think he can do a lot, and I'm comfortable with an offense now of. Two young receivers in Brian Thomas, Lad McConkey, and uh, obviously Hunter Henry and Kendrick Bourne and Demario Douglas, and you move forward from there. So, and, and we also have, which is sort of obvious, I guess, in a way, but um, the opposite of last year's draft, where we're going yeah. offense, 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 just banging out the offense as opposed to the defense, which I know became a point of contention for some people against Bill Belichick and what's he doing and blah blah blah. Okay, uh, you can you can talk me into it. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, this is no Doug Kide Boston Herald mock draft, but it has its merits, and and I can focus on it in certain ways and talk myself into it. You know, I'm finding. Yeah. Who? So, just a quick aside before we get to your next pick at 68. Cool. Um, so you have Jacoby Brissett and Bailey Zappi as your quarterbacks. You have Jacoby Brissett. You have Bailey Zabby for now. And then you have the 193rd pick in the draft, round six. You bring in. AKA better than Brady pick. 
Yeah, we'll skip ahead. We'll go to the 193rd pick. We'll skip ahead in this mock draft and talk about the quarterback position because with the pick you traded Mac Jones for, you draft a quarterback in Kentucky's Devin Leary, who was very good at NC State, who came back down to earth a little bit this year at Kentucky, but he had a great Shrine Bowl. Uh, he's big. He can throw. He threw for over 3,400 yards and 35 touchdowns in his last season in NC State before transferring an older guy. Um, again, he's going to be a developmental guy. I'm not saying he's going to come in and start 16 games here right away. I'm not saying he's going to be your quarterback of the future, but if you have Brissett in the room, you have Zappi in the room and you bring in a third guy in Larry, who maybe the Patriots are five and 11 at one point and Brissett's not getting it done. And you want to see what you have in Devin Leary, you throw him in and maybe you just get a spark and then he can be your backup moving forward. So, um, I'm not hundred percent sold Zappi's even here. Um, I know they like him. I know he's been working out with the receivers. I know you've been a fan of all their social media posts lately. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I so I see it being Brissett, Zappy, and then some other young some other young guy, whoever that may be. I'm not sure how much I love this plan at the quarterback position, but hey, we're it kicking is it down the line. We're not competing this year. We're oh, we're yes, loading we'll, up, and then we're we'll figuring next it out year. later. Yeah. Next year it'll be Shadur Sanders and the Beck kid out of Georgia. And no, Qu Quinn you know. Ewers. Quinn Ewers, I'm down for Quinn, Quinn Ewers, who is going to have a step back because he's going to have two receivers drafted in the first round. Like, so when his stats that, yeah. go down, we're going to rip him like we ripped Drake May, right? We're going to say, oh, exactly. what the hell happened? He's not that good. I don't know where, I, and I'm not the biggest of Quinn Ewers fan. Anyway, okay, we'll so you got your that's, that's That's a next year problem. So I did, uh, looking back at our quarterback podcast and the notes I had taken for that, I did write tempting next to him. Mm -hmm. Um even though as you sort of um, glossed over, I believe he completed 56% of his passes and threw over a dozen interceptions last year at Kentucky, where like he I was. Said, I said he took a step back. He took a step back, but not in terms of leadership because he was a captain at both schools. Mm -hmm. And we know that Alex yeah. Van Pelt likes captains and mm -hmm. he was a captain at both schools. So that will earn him some brownie points with Alex there Van Pelt. So yep. um, my concern is, and I guess this isn't a new age concern, but like, He's 6'1", and I wrote pocket passer. Can move in the pocket, but is pretty much a pocket passer. A little undersized for my pocket passer. If I'm going to be 6'1", I'd like you to be able to do a little roadrunner work every what once in a like while. What about like Baker Mayfield, though? Baker Mayfield's shorter on the shorter side, but he's still a pocket passer. Yeah, I know, and he has ebbed and flowed into whether he sucks or doesn't suck in the NFL. So That's fair, but we would have taken Baker at this point for this team, wouldn't we? I would take anybody right now. I'm yeah. just <laughs> early impressed with the quarterback position. Okay, That's so... Fair. We hit the quarterback late in the draft. We zip back to number uh, sixty-eight. So sure. far, you've gone, you've gone with an offensive lineman and a couple receivers with the sixty-eighth pick on day two. What are you taking? Defense. Oh, what do you got? Defense. We got a defensive player. We got a defensive player. We have a cornerback, Max Melton from Rutgers. Ooh. Rutgers guy. Bill Belichick's in the ear of Elliot Wolf saying, "If you don't take a Rutgers guy." I'm not going to, uh, I don't know. He has no power here anymore, but he's in the air. He's saying, he's saying something about Rutgers, uh, a guy who played at the boundary for them the last couple of seasons. He's six foot nothing. Um, but you know, that, that makes it sound shorter when I say like six foot nothing, but he's six foot yeah, flat. I mean, six, yeah, six foot, foot at quarterback is not really short, right? That's a good height. So he can play on the boundary. He did it for the last couple of seasons, uh, played well. And, I look at him as more of a developmental corner. I don't think he's going to come in and play day one on the boundary like Christian Gonzalez did, but they have Jonathan Jones to play on the boundary for now. They have, you know, Marcus Jones to play on the inside. You can, you know, rotate Alex Austin on the outside for now, but a guy who could become your boundary corner by the end of the season. Then you can move Jonathan Jones to the inside where he's more comfortable, and then you don't have to rely on Marcus Jones, who is more so your punt returner gadget backup cornerback instead of him playing in the slot all season long. So you're going to have to hit corner at some point. It's a, um, it's a need that I don't think many are really thinking about with this team right now, but it's, it's low key a need. And I know, no, I know you know that because it's been your house of cards for the last two years. Um, Gonzalez is great, but they need to build the depth there. And I think uh, addressing it within the first hundred picks of the draft is, uh, is a solid move for them. So Max Melton from Rutgers is the pick. Just to um, add a little context, because I agree with you. I think they need to address the cornerback position. Now, obviously, they could um, address it in the second, third tier of free agency. And while we were recording this, there was a little alert that came across Mass Live. Um, who's reporting that Stefan Gilmore would be open to a return yeah. to New England. His preference is to re-sign with the Cowboys. But I know Tom Curran's been beating that drum that he would make a lot of sense. And I 
for the rare time, agree wholeheartedly with Tom Curran. That does make a lot of sense to pair him up with Christian Gonzalez. I think that's a perfect mentor for your young, theoretically number one star yeah. corner, whatever. Um, but if you don't do that, I do think within the first two days of the draft, you probably have to address the cornerback position and probably get a body that you feel is more prototypical and outside corner. Yeah. And as you said, it kind of lets the other dominoes to fall into places where they're probably better suited um, for the team and for the long haul. So I don't, I don't hate it. And yeah, the Rutgers connection, you can, you know, whatever you still have Brian Belichick, you still have a Belichick right. hanging around and you still have McCordy sort of hanging around and backtracking on things he said in the uh, dynasty documentary and things of that nature. So yeah, what surprised. Do you he's a cornerback. He backtracked. Oh, you, oh God. <laughs> you mentioned Brian Belichick, Andy. I have a question for you. I want to know what you make of this. I looked at the coaches page on Patriots.com the other day. Yep. And the, the rumor, the reporting is that Mike Pellegrino and Brian Belichick are returning to the defensive staff as cornerbacks coach and safeties coach, right? Yep. They're not listed on the coaches page. Why? I don't know. And I don't even have a good plausible, you yeah. know, creative. They didn't announce them with the um with the new coaching staff. They didn't add them to the the um they didn't add them to the website and they weren't at our coaches uh off the record social. So take that what you will. I don't know if this is a conspiracy. I don't know if they're just late updating it, if they haven't inked out and ironed out the contracts yet. But as of right now, they're not listed on the coaches page and it has been updated with everybody else. So, okay. Yeah. I don't have, website, a, like yeah, I don't have a good specific like conspiracy or theory or any, yeah. anything, but worth noting, we'll keep an yeah. eye on that moving forward. Maybe that'll be the topic for a future one-off Wednesday. Where are Mike Pellegrino? And, yeah. and it's like Kate Middleton. Where are those guys? Like, <laughs> yeah. maybe they're all, maybe they're with Kate Middleton. Exactly. We're going to have the paparazzi around uh, Gillette stadium, looking at the entrance to the stadium, just like they are for Kate Middleton at, uh, at Buckingham. Keep TMZ on route one. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's move on to the fourth round pick one Oh three. Um, our second double dip of the first four rounds of the draft. Hmm, yep. Go ahead. We need more offensive tackles on this team. Uh, Blake Fisher, Notre Dame, right tackle, played opposite Joe Alt for the Fighting Irish over the last several seasons. Uh, the Patriots played, I looked this up for this, over 17 games, they played 10 different offensive line combinations. They started 10 different combinations with 11 different offensive linemen. That's too much. And obviously, you're, you're adding depth to the position. You're hoping to not necessarily have to start them. But if you do have to call on a guy, I'll take Blake Fisher as my backup right tackle for right now behind Mike Onwenu, a guy who's experienced. He played, you know, started two full seasons, uh, like I said, with uh, with the Fighting Irish, played opposite Joe Walt. So uh, a good player, a good developmental tackle. Uh, I know that the idea right now, too, is for Onwenu to play right tackle. But if Blake Fisher kicks ass and starts playing really well, and you want to move on Wenu into guard where he's probably more comfortable and frankly, probably better Then you still have that option. If you can develop this guy uh, into your right tackle for the future. So you need depth of the position. Like I said, too many injuries last year, too many different combinations. Sure it up. You added two guys in uh, Okora four and the Leverett kid uh, on the inside in free agency. You add another one in Blake Fisher. So build the depth, continue to build the depth along the offensive line. We, uh, we talked about it again. I keep referencing back to our Six Rings and Prospect Things podcast, the mm -hmm. Tackle Edition. Blake Fisher's a guy that some people think is actually maybe a better all-around tackle than Joe Alt right now. His yeah. teammate at Notre Dame was going to go in the top 10 picks in the draft. He's a right tackle. So you got your guy Fashanu left, your Blake Fisher right. And I also think as you kind of twilight here, the David Andrews era, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ridiculous to say we're losing something at center. Maybe Jake Andrews is in there, whatever. We're a better team if we can put Fisher at right tackle on Wenu at right guard right. and solidified sort of the middle uh, of the pocket or the run blocking. Um, and, and I also wonder, because I do know like the Van Pelt idea of wide zone runs and some of that. Uh, I'm interested to see how that fits with Mike on Wenu at right tackle. Yeah. And would he be better suited at right guard if that is where you're going? Because I know even um, Antonio Gibson said his favorite play is wide zone. Yeah. And if, if that becomes like the bread and butter play of this 
offense and and you build in that direction I'm not sure on when it was the guy you want out front in that athletically I'm not and I'm not saying he can't I'm just saying maybe him at guard with right tackle athleticism and then Blake Fisher at right tackle as more of a prototypical right tackle. maybe you're a better running line um in that scenario so I don't hate the pick again hate the trade all the picks that you've made since the trade I for the most part am fine with and can talk talk into it yeah absolutely so um, let's go quickly as we come up over yeah, the yeah. half hour mark here. Uh, the next couple picks, just bang those out. Sure. Round five, pick 137, running back from Tennessee, Jalen Wright, a guy who flew at the combine, 4'3", 840, a uh, heck of an athlete, 1,000-yard rusher with the Volunteers last year. Uh, you obviously touched on the room in free agency with Antonio Gibson, but that doesn't mean you should be done. It's still really only Gibson and Ramondre who are like your prototypical NFL running backs right now. I mean, Kevin Harris and – uh, Jermichael Hasty. Well, 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 yeah, I know you well, don't well, like. Why are we poo pooing Kevin Harris? Yeah, what are we because doing I just because would you rather Kevin Harris or Jalen Wright right now? Probably Jalen Wright. Exactly. So add him to the room. Go from there. Uh, add to the running back room. I pick one thirty-seven. Moving forward, pick one eighty. Round six. Sione Vaki from Utah, a safety who also logged snaps last year at cornerback, defensive line, and running back for the Utah Utes, a guy who can do it all. Maybe a little Marcus Jones 2.0, maybe a little Marcus Jones insurance if you need another gadget guy. Play him all over the place. Um, Six foot, 208, so he's a little on the smaller side, but again, whips around, plays wherever. So um, a guy who I know the old Patriots would like. We'll see if, uh, you know, he kind of reminds me too of uh, Taki Taki a little bit. He can kind of play all over the field, uh, so they can kind of do the same thing. Vaki and Taki Taki on defense. Why not? That's all I was thinking about. Yeah, that was yeah, all that was turning yeah. through my brain. And all your <laughs> other words were lost on me. I was just thinking. So we have a Vaki and a Taki Taki. I like it. Yeah, I figured um, as much. Uh, go ahead. Do you have anything here? I just guys like that, and and I don't not going to pretend I know a ton about him, but reading and you know listening to you, the safety D line running back. Like I love those tweener athletes with late yeah. round picks, special teams. My guess is he'd be a special yes. teams stud. Um, I like those kind of flyers because sometimes you hit on them and you're like, wow, I have like, I mean, this is disrespectful, but like a poor man's Derwin James or something with this this athlete that I just move all around. And when different guys are out or, or even just become sort of a miles Bryant, maybe an upgrade over miles Bryant, who knows long-term or Julian Uh, Edelman, like Julian Edelman was the receiver obviously, but when you needed to call on him, he played cornerback for like three right. games once. He, like, you know, stuff like right. that. Like, those guys are invaluable sometimes. So, See, that's like, where I cool. say you never um, regret having like a good football player. Yeah. I don't necessarily love using that theory with the third pick in the draft because I right. think there's just so much more that goes into it. But as you get further from the top of the draft, I think that's true. If you have guys in a room that you know are football players, competitors, athletes, you'll never regret. You'll figure out where they fit, how they contribute, whatever. Um, so I don't hate it. As I said, um, oh yeah. Oh, you got one more pick. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um, well they said that too about Slater and they said it with Edelman, like Belichick called them and said, I don't know where you're going to play yet, but I know you're going to be a good player. So right. but that's the same, with that's what I see in, uh, Sione Vaki. You round out the thing. We talked about Devin Leary already, but our seventh round pick goes with a tight end tip Raymond, Illinois athletic stud, six foot five, two seventy. uh, the RAS score, I don't know if you're familiar or if you buy into it, relative athletic score. Uh, it's a draft uh, draft analytic. He scored a yeah, 9. Yeah, Anthony 9. Richardson, right? Isn't he the best yes. ever? Yeah, okay. a 9.92 uh, out of 10 was 10th out of 1,100 tight ends uh, since the stat started. So he's, an, he's a heck of an athlete. He didn't catch a ton of – he didn't catch a ton of balls at Illinois. He only caught 41 passes over three years. But, again, seventh-round pick, bring in an athlete, see what happens – take a flyer and add him to the room with Hunter Henry and Austin Hooper. So that rounds out mock draft uh, 3.0. If you want to read the rest of it and, you know, go in a little bit more detail, go check it out at WEI.com. Okay. And I, I crapped all over the trade just because yes, I want to stay put at number three and take a quarterback, but Deep down, I appreciate, I do yeah, I know. And I appreciate <laughs> the fact that as we go through the different uh, versions of these, even Daniel Jeremiah has talked about, he does different things trying to like, just go with different ideas and it is a mosaic and everybody hell fans do this on those draft um, simulators that you can do online. Like, I'll just do a different one here and see how the butterfly effect changes the rest of the draft. And Oh, look who's available, blah, blah, blah. So I do appreciate it. Um, I don't appreciate having to watch Jacoby Brissett be the quarterback for most of next year. So therefore uh, I cannot give you my stamp of approval on this version. Um, 
I will therefore give my stamp of approval to Doug Kide over at the Boston Herald for there his version that gets him Drake May and A.D. Mitchell. But uh, I will look forward, as I said, to version 4.0, where hopefully you get back to getting a quarterback in the number three spot. Um, because I think that is a uh, massive priority. Anyway, so that's going to do it for Six Rings and Football Things Mock Draft Edition 3.0, brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more, and I think we'll all agree that we need more from Mike Cadlick in version 4.0 than just an offensive lineman and a couple receivers, because quarterbacks rule the world. He should know that as well as anyone, even though he's left-handed. We need quarterbacks. So (laughs) for Mike Cadlick, WEEI.com, I'm Andy Jumbo Hart. This has been another... Six Rings and Football Things Mock Draft Edition. See ya.